Yes, it did happen, and the big story made us quite happy. Uh, two teams in, first time the conference has ever pulled that off. Michigan, the two seed, gets a first round matchup with TCU in Arizona. Ohio State is the four. They get the defending national champ and top seed Georgia in Atlanta. We're going to take a deep dive into these matchups a little bit later in the show, but, but thought we'd start just by talking about each of the Big Ten teams that made it in. Let's start with Michigan. Incredible accomplishment when you think about everything that they went through in the offseason from Jim Harbaugh <laughs> talking about potentially taking NFL jobs to having replaced both coordinators to losing a ton of talent, particularly on the defensive side of the ball. And yet here they are not only back in the playoff, but back in a better spot than they were in last year. Absolutely. And that was important when you were around this team on Sunday, as I was, that they were really talking about they, they snuck in. They, they were in as a four, right? And, and to be there as a two seed. They also went all the way back to the 2020 season. That was a real low point of the Jim Harbaugh era and of the recent history of Michigan football. And so to imagine going from there to where we are now, two straight college football playoff appearances, there's a lot of pride within this program, especially with the players who have been there this whole time and seen internally what had to change and how to get up to this point. I think, too, one thing that was really noticeable, especially as we compare it to last year, was J.J. McCarthy told me about this on Sunday, and Jim Harbaugh's talked about it, but this team last year said that they were shooting for Ohio State. They were shooting for a Big Ten title. This year, they're shooting for a national title. So, so the, the steps along the road felt different, and I think you saw that in the way they celebrated Ohio State and the way that they celebrated on Saturday night. Yeah, it, it really is a remarkable turn of events for where you think about Michigan was three maybe four years ago. And it was like, they can't win, they can't get the big one. And there was a transformation that I think Jim Harbaugh went through, uh, starting at media day that, you know, he just, he just seemed to be much more comfortable, loose, smiling, enjoying the situation. Because before it looked like it was tough. And I can only imagine the type of pressure it is to be the head coach of Michigan to be uh, to be who he is and have the success at the NFL level, the college level. And now you're back trying to take your your alma mater back to, to prominence. And you really see the pride and the the confidence that these young people have in where they are right now in understanding what the history used to be in saying that we're here right now. We're going to be where our feet are. And we're going to continue to try to dominate and go to where we need to be. You know what else he did? He, he had to revamp that staff, right? He also took the pay cut. Staff got really young. I mean, yes. there's new energy, yep. and then there have been different coordinators. But, but fundamentally, the same system, right. consistency across that. He changed quarterbacks this year. But he's done all of these different things with a staff around him that's yeah. really supported it. And we've talked about this all year, but there's a lot of rising stars yes. on that coaching staff, too. Yes, it too. is. Yeah, and that's been important. And I think it's been important for him to be able to connect with the players through his staff and understanding that. And, again, I, listen, Michigan is back where they need to be. College football, this conference is better when Michigan is playing the way they've been playing the last two years. And it really is uh, amazing to watch just how they've done it because they, they're doing it a lot different than I think we're accustomed to seeing it the history of Michigan football. One thing that really strikes me, and it gets to what both of you are saying, is change is hard. And it's hard to get change right. And you think about, even if you go down the list of people hiring one assistant coach, one coordinator, and you get it wrong, and, and it can make a profound impact on your program. And to have to make as many changes as he had to make when, frankly, he had gotten some things wrong along the way. Like, Don Brown was wrong, yeah. right? Wasn't a, it doesn't mean Don Brown's not a good coach. It just means Don Brown was the wrong fit mm -hmm. for Michigan as a defensive coordinator. So you kind of go down the road and you say, okay, now you got to get six or seven hires right and, and to get them all. And now you got to make the right choice on a quarterback and to do that. It's hard. You're threading a needle at that point. Again, like if each one of these is a coin flip, or or maybe it's slightly better than a coin flip because you have some uh, you have some acumen, right? You yeah. you have the ability. You're a smart football person. And you say, okay, I'll get it right 
60% of the time or 70% of the time. But to get every single one of your 60 or 70% calls right, the odds are against that, and yet he did it. And, and I think back, too, about early teams in his tenures, and we've talked a lot about the teams that would go and mm -hmm. lose badly to Ohio State. Yeah. Not having that type of quarterback that could do what Cade McNamara did last year yeah. and what J.J. did this year, step up in those moments. I think about the Michigan State game last mm -hmm. year that they lost. Mm -hmm. That was the last of those big games that they lost. Yeah. They learned how to win them after that. When he came to Michigan, he was considered a quarterback whisperer. But if you remember earlier, it was really about transfers that were coming in. Right. And the, the knock was he can't develop quarterbacks or he hasn't been able to develop them at Michigan. Then he gets K. Then he gets J.J. And quite frankly, there was a lot of talk J.J.'s senior year at IMG that he wouldn't enroll. It never came from, from J.J. at all, but it, that was just the outside perception because Michigan football was not going the way they thought it would go. And remember, Josh Gaddis was struggling as the offensive coordinator for a while. He stuck with him another year, and things got right. And, and the quarterback thing is really interesting because I think about this a lot from a macro sense of where college football is. It's so hard to have depth at that position, right? Yes. Because the second someone loses a job, yeah. they leave. And I remember thinking all of last season that Michigan was the only place that really had that luxury because you had a five-star quarterback mm -hmm. waiting in the wings okay with not being the guy at that point, yeah. being worked in different packages, put in, in, in situations where he could succeed, and then he goes and wins the job this year. And that's how mm -hmm. you develop, right? That's how you bring in a younger guy who can then win the starting quarterback job and now be ready for this. Handled the quarterback position masterfully. And again, when you think about, I don't want to use the word failures early on, but kind of averageness yeah. early on at quarterback in his tenure. Again, to have gotten Cade McNamara right, and I, th I think we need to say he did get Cade McNamara Absolutely. right. He got him to the playoff. Yep. Yeah. He was the right guy for them. But then to have the fortitude to say, I feel like we're going to need to make a change here, and I'm going to at least leave open the possibility that we're going to do that in this time where, as you say, all it takes is <laughs> one, one night on the phone with the parents or with whomever is advising you to say, I want you to get out of there. There's got to be somewhere else. To, to strike that balance, it's it's really impressive. And now, now they got to figure out a way to, to win a bowl game because because they've lost five in a row. No doubt. They've yeah. got to figure that out. But getting here is part of the process. Now we got two teams that have to be able to figure it out. But uh, going back to this quarterback uh, competition one more time, there's probably, if you poll ten people, right, nine of them would have said that is the wrong thing to do the way they handled it. Probably not, because I questioned it, because it made no sense, right? It really didn't, the way it was laid out. Yep. And again, give a lot of credit to the two quarterbacks that were in that situation, because it wasn't easy. From the outside looking in, it looked painful. But they, they're still good buddies, and they really got the team where they needed to be. Pushed all the right buttons. Yeah. No, no doubt about it. But but again, there's so many other people along the yep, way. no doubt. Who have to, to buy into the uh, button pushing. As for the Buckeyes, they needed help. They got help. And now you've got a shot of redemption. It is a tough game. <laughs> and, and we'll get into the matchup in a bit. But for Ohio State, kind of this new lease on life, how are you viewing the Buckeyes as they head into the playoff? I think that's the perfect way to think about it. Because if you're saying two weeks ago – that the season's over, the sky has fallen. Now all of a sudden you have this opportunity to write things really quickly. I mean, we were in a situation where you're thinking you have 364 days before you can do the thing that everyone is upset about that you have to focus on and try to fix. Now all of a sudden, a month later, you're getting a team in Georgia that's the gold standard in the sport, but also their strengths are similar to Michigan's in the physicality and the way that they like to control and win games. And so it's that type of challenge, but it's a perfect opportunity to brush off the, the, the loss to Michigan and prove that you are one of the best teams in the country. That's what they're trying to do, right? When we say that the sky is falling because you can't <laughs> win one game on your schedule, it's because that one game separates the you from the opportunity to win a national championship. Right. You get this second chance. Now you prove that you belong there. It, it is amazing, though, that how excited everyone was about this Ohio State team. And this happens in one game. 
right? The, the excitement just drains a building. People start to look at Ohio State differently because of that particular game. And I get it because we look at them. They say, hey, it's, it's about winning national titles. The opportunity to win that two weeks ago was taken away. Now, all of a sudden, they have it back in front of them. To me, this is a job that they're going to have to do, the psychology of the game. We talk a lot about that. This is going to be important in this game because there are things that, that Georgia is going to be able to do that, as you mentioned, they're very similar to what Michigan is. And, and you might be able to make the, the, the argument that they may be more physical than, than Michigan is at this particular point. But, you know, that's for later in the show. But Ohio State has this opportunity in front of them. Coach Day needs to be able from the front of the room to articulate what it is they have a chance to do and not be caught up in what's happened in the Michigan game. And I know he will. They'll do a great job. But it's right in front of them now to go out. And, and just the thought of being able to compete against, have an Ohio State-Michigan final championship game? I mean, <laughs> Dave, you covered one, two, right? You covered I covered that. one, two. Yeah. You covered that. Yeah. Could you imagine – the scope that this game would have, the magnitude of this game. You know what would be so cool about that? We had North Carolina and Duke in the Final Four this year. Yeah. That was the first time yeah. that that yeah. had ever happened. And then to possibly end the college football season <laughs> with Michigan, Ohio State for a national title. Like, these are just unprecedented situations. And yeah. it's amazing to think about. It would be really cool. And, of course, there was a thought after that game in 2006 that maybe we should just – Yep. run it back and, uh -huh. and play it again. And, of course, it turned out Ohio State didn't even win the national championship. But I remember kind of pondering it at the time and having been at that 1-2 yeah. game and, and realizing, of course, that was the day after Bo Schembechler died. Right. I mean, it was a really crazy mm -hmm. few days. But just everything permeating that day and to, to think if that was a, a national championship game. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> no, but, no. but it would be. And, and I, I do think, and again, we'll get into the matchup here in a bit, but – Kind of to your point, Nicole, like, okay, so what, what were we thinking about Ohio State two weeks ago and kind of the way that their star may have faded a little bit? They still have unbelievable talent. I mean, they've still recruited at a ridiculous level. Yeah. So maybe kind of mentally we got ourselves in this space where oh, they've got to retool it again, they got to figure it out. I mean, they still have incredible talent, right? Like we're, we're at a point now where if you were to say who can match up with Georgia talent-wise – it's not a very long list before you get to Ohio State. I mean, maybe one. Yeah, and I think that's what makes this such an interesting matchup. Yeah. This is why it's the primetime game, right. Yes. right? Like, this is because of the athletes you're going to have mm -hmm. and the talent on paper. I mean, if you're Georgia, are you happy about this draw, right? Like, are you <laughs> like, oh, we, may, we got the team that, like, at their top end could absolutely beat us, right? So I think that's where you're coming in, right? Because you do know how much talent is there. It's just, you know, can they put it all together and fire on all cylinders at one time? But absolutely. I mean, when, when we think about why there's a small group of teams that year in and year out we think are college football playoff contenders, mm -hmm. it's because of the talent on the roster, yeah. and that's where Ohio State is. Yeah, I agree. I think if you were Georgia and you could pick a team to play, TCU or Ohio State, again, no disrespect at all to no. TCU, who I think is a fabulous team. Yeah. But you would have picked TCU. You could make the argument yes. that Michigan really was the number one team because they got an opportunity to play of the other three, yes. TCU. Yes, no doubt. Our big stat presented by Gatorade, focusing on the full slate of Big Ten bowl games. We told you about the two in the CFP. All the fun starts on December the 27th. Wisconsin's in Arizona to take on Oklahoma State. Minnesota heads to Yankee Stadium for a date with the Qs. Maryland gets an old conference foe, NC State, in Charlotte. Iowa looks to exact some revenge on Kentucky. Second straight year, they have squared off in a bowl game. Penn State will head to Pasadena, fifth time in school history. It's January 2nd this year, the traditional January 1st games, all January 2nd. So Purdue in the Citrus Bowl, the Battle of LSU, Illinois, in Tampa against Mississippi State. Uh, let's start with Penn State in Pasadena. And Howard, I think we've hammered home this theme for a few weeks. I do think it bears repeating, though. This is a great reward for a really good season. <laughs> it really is. And I think when you're in the midst of it, if you're a Penn State fan, you, you're a little frustrated and a little disappointed. But when you think about ultimately who you lost to, <laughs> I mean, you lost to some really, really good teams. Two teams in the playoffs. And you weren't that far out of that the top four, right? So... 
I, I think this is an exciting time for Penn State. We've talked about their ability to continue to build. We've watched that happen with some of the great talent that they've brought in that's really helped them get to this point. Now it's about continuing to build, trying to take that next step where now they've already shown that they can compete. The Michigan game was, uh, I don't think that was necessarily Penn State, the way they played it at their best. But I guess you have to feel like you're really close. If you're a Penn State fan, if you're, you're on that coaching staff, you're, you're really close. And, and this is just another opportunity to continue to – say, hey, we're, we're just not the number three team in the East. We are a really good football team, and they're going to continue to do a great job recruiting. Yeah, I think this is maybe going to be the number one game that I'm excited for. I know we're going to be excited for the semifinals, so I'll take yeah. them out. But, like, the matchup itself is great. And, and for both of these teams, yeah. it's such a draw. It's such a reward. I mean, Utah went to the Rose Bowl for the very first time last right. year. They had those awesome <laughs> helmets we all remember with the yeah. Rose, yes. you know, Beautiful. looped yeah. in. Um, and that game was amazing, and their crowd showed up, and you know that that's going to happen. Penn mm -hmm. State fans are going to travel for this because it's been a while. But, you know, you've got – there's there's tough players. You know how much yeah. I love Cam Rising, yep. Utah's quarterback. <laughs> we all saw him on Friday night. Mm -hmm. We saw him will his team to victory over USC in the Pac-12 championship game. He is tough as nails, mm -hmm. and he's also a great passer, and, and this team has a high end, and, yeah. and they dealt with injuries. They've had their ups and downs. If they don't go and open the season, with the loss at Florida, I think maybe we talk about them very differently in terms of the CFP picture and the Pac-12 race throughout the year. So this is a really good opponent, really good test for Penn State, mm -hmm. and a great opportunity for those young guys that were all excited about at Penn State to have an experience yeah. like this. So that you could say, yeah, well, we're ready for a Big Ten title or, or playoff. We can step into those arenas. Right. The, the play on Friday night, we were watching it together. With the helmet. Indy, where the helmet <laughs> flew off and everyone went, oh! Yeah, that was, that was, that was <laughs> he like, pops up and comes <laughs> back out. Here we know? go. And he gets right back up. Uh, he, he is. Tough cut. No, he is. He is. And I, I do think we were talking about this a little bit yesterday on our show. The reputation, deservedly, of Utah with oh. Kyle Whittingham is fabulous defense. Right. But they have a dynamic offense. I mean, well over 200 yards rushing and passing on average. So yeah. it's a huge challenge for Penn State. But Penn State's awfully good, too. They will challenge Utah in so many different ways. The Rose Bowl deserves a matchup like this. Yeah. It is yeah. a special sure. bowl game. It yeah. deserves a special matchup. Yeah. And, and this is a, a really good one when you're not a, a CFP yeah. semifinal. LSU and Purdue, these are two teams kind of in a similar spot, right? Lost their conference championship games. I mean, LSU was being talked about as recently as a couple weeks ago as a <laughs> yeah. team that could sneak into the playoffs. So this is going to be a big challenge here for Purdue. Obviously, LSU did not finish the season well, but a really talented team that spent a lot of the year in the top ten. Yeah, and they're ahead of schedule. This is Brian Kelly's first year, and I think a lot of people thought that he could coach. We all know yeah. that and that he'd recruit really well there, but I think getting to the SEC championship game was something that not everyone necessarily thought would happen in year one, and you watch Jaden Daniels, the quarterback, get better throughout mm -hmm. the season. Their issue, and it's cost them multiple games, is special teams. They, right from the beginning of the season, Blocked, boxed mm -hmm. kicks, muff punts. It's been a problem all season long. And we saw in the SEC championship game, there was a blocked kick and no one responded. Right. No one realized that it was a live ball. So those are the types of plays that, like, when you're looking at, like, championship caliber teams, yes. they don't make those mistakes on yeah. special teams. So that could be an opportunity for Purdue, though. If they can shore those things up, we know they love their trick plays and there might be some of that on special teams. They're going to have an opportunity here. Yeah, and you look at that roster, they still have a very talented roster. You talk about the speed, you talk about the athleticism. This is what LSU has been about. Now, Brian Kelly is there. And it's interesting because when you have that type of talent on your roster, special teams should never be the issue because you have great athletes that you're able to put on special teams because there may be a two or a three as far as the depth chart is concerned in other areas. But this is one of those games that with Coach Brom being able to scheme the way he does, right, it's about really getting into the third and to the fourth quarter and things staying uh, close or being able to maintain that lead. That This is where I think Brom and just the coaching ability that that staff from an offensive standpoint really has an opportunity to really make some hay. And, you know, we, we know what Aiden O'Connell can do when he's not under pressure. And all of a sudden – what they've added this year, that run game, will really be able to keep them off balance. So I like the matchup. And 
There's also something to be said. I don't know that LSU will have a great deal of respect for this Purdue team. I mm. just don't think they'll feel that way. I, I, I know that Brian Kelly will try to, try to get him to understand, look, guys, these 17, 18-year-old 8 year young people, and I just think they'll say, well, we're great athletes. We, we know how to play the game. They don't play the game the same way we do down here. And this is one of those games where I think the opponents don't necessarily have the respect for their so, for Purdue. Are you saying a spoiler maker game? I'm just <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what's interesting? They don't really like the spoiler maker. I know, but they I, don't I like, like it. I like we to do. say it. They, they want us to think that they can win these. They can things. do it all Absolutely, the time. Right. But they're, they're I mean, getting, they are. Yeah. But yeah, exactly. I'm still gonna use the word. It's fine. <laughs> well, if, if there's something LSU might be questioning right now, it's its defense. I mean, 88 points allowed the last two games. Now, granted, problem. one of them was against Georgia, who's awfully <laughs> good, but but still. Uh, Mississippi State in Illinois. We were talking about this matchup yesterday on our show and also talked about it with Brett Bielema and how excited I am. <laughs> I mean, I just love when you get one team that is known for something, and then the other whose strength directly opposes that. Uh -huh. And in this case, you have Mississippi State, which is a wide-open offensive attack, although, as Nicole reminded us on the show mm -hmm. yesterday, they are they slightly more yeah. committed, incrementally more committed to running the ball this year. And, and then Illinois got the best pass defense by a wide margin, yeah. by some measures, in America. Yeah, probably one of the most physical secondaries that, that it is the most physical secondary that, that Michigan had seen. And they talked about the problems that Illinois created for them. But this is Illinois. You talk about the secondary. You talk about their front four, too. They they get pressure or their front three. They get pressure on teams a lot. And they've been able to play in the backfield and be able to make different things happen there. So you'd like to see that. I, I think what's also fun, and Brett mentioned this, the press conferences are going to be fun between these two. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't know himself what, a little short there, yeah. right? Just, just There's no telling what's going to come out of these two yes. coaches' mouths. Yes. It's true. And, and Brett obviously has SEC experience, and he can impart that onto the yeah. team about what you're going to expect. Although you're right, like the air raid and the way that Mississippi State is built is a little bit different. The, the stat I'll give you is about 30% of their offense is is the run they are running the ball effectively enough that this is not entirely one-dimensional yeah. so that is important and it's it's helped them it's helped them win games their defense has helped them win games so there are some things that go against the the trend lines for for a mike mike leach <laughs> team um but i do think i'm with you guys i think this is a sneaky really interesting bowl game and i think it's gonna be a fun one it's a nice reward too for the illinois players they have not played in a florida bowl game this century and you've got a ton of players yeah. on their roster who are from Florida mm -hmm. nearly 20 Florida natives on that roster so I think it's you kind of look at this as a reward for the season a way to start building for next year but definitely a reward for what you've done this is one of those games that really feels like a reward and I, I, th I think jumping off point too because yep. you know if you beat an SEC team like this mm -hmm. what does that mean how excited are we going to be for the future of these this Illinois program yeah, and you, you think about, uh, you have to say they're ahead of schedule. Way ahead, yeah. Way ahead of schedule, yeah. right? And you know, they had opportunities to play in that championship game uh, and weren't able to close, but that was going to be a learning experience as they continue to move forward. But it's funny, we haven't said anything about Chase Brown. Or so. when, yeah. you think about, when you think about the coaches, that's why it's so interesting, right? Because this is probably one of those games where the coaches are so much, they're so interesting in some of the things that are going to be said, but they're tremendous players on both sides of the football here. We're going to get to win number nine, Illinois, as would be the most since 2007 for the Fighting Illini. Wisconsin playing in its 21st straight bowl game. That is the third longest active streak in the nation. They get Oklahoma State in the guaranteed rate bowl in Phoenix. They've won seven of their last eight bowl games, best win percentage in the FBS in that span. QB issues on both sides. Graham Mertz is in the portal. Spencer Sanders is banged up. So hard to really know what to expect here in this one, but uh, intriguing nonetheless. It is, and um, you know, it's not just the quarterback uh, position for Oklahoma State. They've been a confusing team all season long. For anyone who has not been paying attention, they, they've been in the top 10. They've been a team that I thought could, could contend and win the Big 12. Then they get blanked by Kansas State. They've gotten blown out in a number of games. I mean, they've been all over the map this year. So you don't really know what to expect. And again, that defensive coordinator of last year's team that led them to that special season, well, he's now at Ohio State. 
Right. So um, not just the quarterback position that you got to wonder about. It's going to be I, I can't imagine watching the film of this team and just seeing the wide range of potential <laughs> outcomes yeah, that this team is capable yeah, of. Yeah, You have to be well prepared when you face this team. But, you know, the Badgers have some question marks, too. You know, uh, particularly at the quarterback spot, as you just mentioned. So that's one of the trips I'm going to need to make, make my way up to Madison, kind of get an idea just how this transition is happening. But you have to believe that they ultimately will try to run the football and try to get back to some of the things that they've done in the past, because I think you can have more control of of what you want to do. And and you're talking about playing a quarterback that's not going to have a great deal of, of experience as far as leading this team. So how wide open will this offense be? Will they rely upon the run? How much can they do that Uh, defensively? What are they going to start to look like as they go through the transition of the Luke Fickle coming in to take over? So there are a lot of question marks that I have around this team. But I think at their core, one of the things we know about this team from a personality standpoint is they're going to play. They're going to show up every week. I'm so interested about this transition because, you know, a lot of places are going through this. When you Mm -hmm. go through a coaching change, not all of them have a bowl game, right? So you're kind of maneuvering that. But we're still waiting to find out if Jim Leonard is going to stay and be part of the Wisconsin program moving forward. We know that that is a possibility and says quite a bit about Jim Leonard, by the way. But, you know, waiting for that to the certainty around that to to, to permit – to solidify um, and then you know you've got Luke Fickle and he is going to be recruiting out of the portal he's going to be recruiting we've got early signing day period coming up and evaluating the current roster there is so much that still needs to happen for this Wisconsin period while preparing for a game so it's going to be very interesting to see that transitional period yeah no doubt now this is I I'm kind of with Jerry made the point yesterday and I, I'm I'm with him it's a great luxury I think for Luke Fickle to be able to Again, there's not a ton of pressure on whether or not you win the game, but it's a chance to evaluate your roster and spend time around your guys. And mm-hmm. and so I do think that that helps you quite a bit. Iowa's got massive QB issues. <laughs> Spencer Petras <laughs> is hurt. Uh, you've got Padilla in the portal. They face Kentucky for the second straight year, mm-hmm. uh, which is odd. Now, Will, it's uh, no one really knows what's going on with Will Levis at Kentucky yeah. either. So, again, uh, there's so much uncertainty on both these teams, but what do we kind of make of, of Iowa as they head into this game? Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to underscore how odd it is. Like, this is a te- these two teams played right. to start the 2022 calendar year, and they're going to close out the 22 mm-hmm. calendar year by playing each other. So that's strange. And in last year's game, we all were convinced it was going to be this, like, defensive struggle and this showdown, and it was one of the more entertaining yeah. bowl games. So not knowing who's going to be at quarterback, if Will Levis is going to mm-hmm. play because he's declared for the NFL draft already. Um, I mean, you're going to have opportunities for younger guys or guys that really don't have much experience, which means that this game could get wild, yeah. I think. It, but I also think that the, the defenses could dominate. You don't know. They're yeah, all very you, physical you and aggressive, know. and we'll see. But I think you're right. You talk about young players being able to have that opportunity to step up and really be able to contribute. And, and they did do have done a good job in the previous years of recruiting over at Kentucky. Uh, but this Iowa team, as we look at it, we know the kind of issues that they had from an offensive standpoint. So you only can imagine that it becomes a little bit tougher in this situation. But they have the time to be able to practice. You get those practices that they'll be able to go out and figure out what they need to do and put a game plan that's best going to suit really the team that they have right now, not being concerned about what happened during the year. And, and maybe there's just a little bit less pressure. We're talking about the pressure to win a game. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. you have Cade McNamara, right? You know, yes. you have him waiting in the wings. You're going to have him next year. So even if certain things don't look great offensively, at least yes. you have that quarterback. You, you do have that pass, yes. right? Yes. Where, yes. hey, we've addressed that. Yes. And it's the going is to coming. get better. And Kentucky's <laughs> really good defensively, yeah. as we know, re- really well coached. Mark's teams. Yeah, good. Uh, I, I believe I said Levis is in the portal, but actually declared for the yeah. declared for the draft. He's been in college football forever. So. <laughs> uh, He's been eating mayo, drinking yeah. yes, mayo. Yes, exactly. No, I know. Oh, yeah. yeah banana, no. we'll, all that. I would say we'll miss him on social media, but I, <laughs> I believe he'll only accentuate it as he moves on. Uh, Minnesota is headed to the Pinstripe Bowl. They get a date with Syracuse. Yeah. Uh, what do we think of, of this one? Another team facing a team in its home state. Yeah, you know, I, I like the opportunity that, that Minnesota has because you, you figure out what are they going to do at the quarterback position because they've got a lot of upside with their young players. And, and then we get another opportunity to see Mo, and, and I think that's really what's exciting. And this is going to be one of those games. You don't never know whether weather is going to be a part of it. 
but an opportunity for them to be able to send Mo out the right way and the rest of the seniors, I think, will be significant. And they need to get back to, you know, playing the game the way they had when they got had success. And really, I was controlling the line of scrimmage, dominating the time of possession, and turning around and handing it off. I think they're going to have a real opportunity to do that. This is a Syracuse team that got off to a really hot start at the beginning of the season, and then it totally just fell apart. I mean, five-game losing streak. Yeah. They snapped it at the end of the season, but it has just not been easy for them. And, you know, you, you look back and you wonder how much of it was a product of the schedule. Mm -hmm. and, and that final minute against Purdue yes. being a real big part of that, if Purdue doesn't have those penalties, nope, no. that game goes differently. So I do think there's going to be some real opportunities here for, for Minnesota to end this season on. On a high note and I, 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 I that's that's what it's my gut as, as we see this matchup just knowing the way that Syracuse ended their season and they ended it by struggling mightily against the run yeah. they gave up an average well, of more than 200 yards per game a particularly in the last dangerous area that's to a struggle problem against. when you're facing Minnesota we know how good the Gophers have been in bowl games looking for their sixth straight bowl win that would be a new Big Ten record it would be pretty remarkable what about Maryland and NC State? Again, you're kind of continuing this theme where you're playing a team in its home state, the Dukes Mayo Bowl here. NC State, really good at defensively. We know about Dave Doran. Mm -hmm. They've got quarterback uncertainty as well. It feels like that's a, a theme Bing. running through this. What do you think of this one? Yeah, they've played four different quarterbacks this season, and um, the, the hopes to win the ACC and have a really special season really mm -hmm. took a hit when Devin Leary went out. Um, but very tough defensively and, and very tough mentally. We talked about the psychology yeah. for them to close out the season the way that they did. My favorite part about this matchup, you guys know how much of a fan I am of the Mayo Bowl in general, and someone close to the Mayo Bowl has told me that if Maryland wins, which Mike Loxley has said that he is all in for the okay. Mayo to be dumped on his head, <laughs> that they would put Old Bay in it okay. because – Maryland. So yeah. I need this to happen. <laughs> I, I really need this to happen more than I need anything else to happen over the next month. That would be a fabulous look for Coach Loxley. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Doused in mayo and Old Bay. Yeah, well, a, little, a little seasoning on top. Yeah. And yeah. the fact that it really, what it, the important part of it and why he doesn't mind is because they've, they've won the that game. That means you've won. <laughs> that yes. means you've won. And yeah. this is a Maryland team that we've watched. And we know they've gotten better uh, throughout the, the time that Coach Loxley has been the head coach. But now they're getting to a point where, okay, you're a better team, probably. So can you go out and, and handle your business the way you need to? And, you know, they've played some really good games, but they've had some meltdowns at times. Uh, that they've, But they've been correctable mistakes. So now it's about them being able to do some of that. And they're going to continue to recruit us. You know, we, we talk about these bowl, bowl season. It's an opportunity for those recruits out actually to come to campus and see the team practicing and spend more time. So I think it's a great opportunity, but it's about them closing out on the field, and they'll need that defense to step up and play well for them. This is a strength-on-strength strength game, too. Uh, we know how good Dave Doran is. His mm -hmm. defense is exceptional. They led the ACC in scoring D, so see whether or not that dynamic Maryland attack can move it down the field against the Wolfpack. The Verbo Fiesta Bowl, New Year's Eve day, the first of two CFP games. Michigan and TCU meeting for the first time ever. A Wolverines team that leads the nation in scoring margin facing a Horned Frogs group that has made a living off of narrow wins. Whoever comes out of this one will play for a national championship. So, Howard, what will it take for the Wolverines to be the team that moves on? Well, I think... First of all, they have to be able to do what they've done in the past, and that's really be able to control the line of scrimmage uh, defensively, continue to play tough up front, be able to get into the backfield, and, and not allow the quarterback to be able to step up in the pocket and, and have clean reads. And we know they'll be physical on the defensive side. The secondary has really gotten very active, and, and it's a very confident bunch, particularly coming out of, the, out of the Big Ten championship game. They really were able to make a lot of plays in that game, but that's what it's going to come down to. J.J. is going to have to do what he needs to do at, at the quarterback spot, too. But I think this is a team that, that's really dialed in, and, and they're going to have to be able to make those adjustments because TCU is going to make some plays. They are going to make some plays, no question about it. They, they have a, an elite wide receiver that can cause a lot of problems. So giving up the big plays is something that they want to eliminate. Yeah, and they can run the ball, too. I mean, that offense is, is obviously their strength, yeah. and, and it's been that way, and the selection committee was digging them for their defense, right, about them being imbalanced as the season went on. What I like about this matchup, and both these teams, I think, watched the other play on Saturday because of the timing and just kind of waiting around either before or after their game, 
I love the quarterbacks in this because you've got one guy who I think is going to be a Heisman Trophy finalist in Max Duggan, who has the highs and the lows of college football. He has lost the starting position. He dealt with a heart issue and came back. He has had such an amazing career at TCU. And then you have J.J. McCarthy, and the tools are all there, and you see all of this potential, and we're watching him get better and more confident the more he plays. And he's played really well in these last two weeks in these big games. So I'm so interested to see how that is handled. But I just think in general what this is going to come down to is Michigan's offense and TCU's defense, right? If this is the one where you're saying, okay, no Blake Corum. If he's out for the year. We've seen Donovan Edwards step up. We've seen them involve the tight ends and different guys in the past game, what can you do? Because you know that Max Duggan, they're never going to quit in this game. These are both second-half teams. So can they keep up if it becomes a little bit of a shootout? I think they can. But that's really where the pressure, I think, is going to be in this game. But I do think Michigan's defense is also going to have some confidence coming into this yeah. as well. You just you can never say die with TCU because they'll come back and win in the final second. Exactly. I, I think it's – dangerous to go into a game like this and say that there is one unit that is suspect because you don't get to this point unless you're right. a really yep. good football team. That being said, TCU's defense is somewhat average mm -hmm. on the scale of certainly of elite college football teams. I mean, I think if you were to go down everyone in this playoff yeah. and to find the weakest unit of all, mm -hmm. it's TCU's defense. Yeah. And, and so... We have seen Michigan against pretty good defenses wear people down as games go along. And so when you've got a defense that's somewhere around you know, 60 or so in the nation in rushing defense, are they going to be able to keep up with Michigan in the second half? This has been the formula. Right. And it's funny, right? You right. say in the second half. Yeah. Because, you know, you might be able to keep it close early. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, then they're going to put like, on the gap. TC is really good. Yeah. Right? Like, I, we all agree. They're really is, good. But this is – Yeah. This is what you're talking about when you have four teams, right? You're looking for the team that, okay, where well, you're not that good in this area and you're playing against a Michigan team. And then how about this? There's probably a good chance that Edwards won't be wearing a soft cast in this one because there's enough time yeah. that's taken place. So, you know, we haven't seen him as involved in the passing game and some of the things that he really can do. It'll be, if he has that ability, this becomes a very tough team to defend. And, you know, just going back to that second half thing, I mean, part of why Michigan's been so effective, the defense obviously wearing teams down, but also they've just chewed so much clock in the second half. Yeah. You keep the ball away from Max Duggan and company, mm -hmm. that also helps. And so I think that all of that's going to be really interesting. And I'll tell you guys this, because I was in Michigan's selection watch party on Sunday, they cheered when they saw it was TCU. And I think part of that's because they didn't want to rematch with Ohio State <laughs> like three weeks later. Yeah. But they wanted this matchup. They're ready yeah. for it. Uh, what about Ohio State? What will it take for the Buckeyes to beat what is a really, really good Georgia team? Yeah, well, it's going to take that that top end. I mean, we've seen Ohio State when all cylinders are firing, right? We've seen how good this offense can be. They've dealt with injuries. They've had some games where they couldn't run the ball. We've seen all of those issues. Yeah. We saw the defensive problems against Michigan. They need to play their best football game of the entire season. Georgia feels like they are in championship mode. We mm -hmm. saw that against LSU on Saturday. So, I, I, again, like the talent is there. All the pieces are there. Can they fit together and, and play their best game? The mistakes that they made versus Michigan, they can't make those mistakes. They can't put themselves in that situation. Can they adjust the scheme defensively so they don't have to? Sure, they can do it, but they're going against arguably the best tight end group in, in America. And what that does is when they go too tight and then all of a sudden they extend, are, they, are there safeties that are trying to cover the big guys? Are there linebackers? You just don't know. It's going to be interesting to see what kind of scheme they come up with to defend this team because this is a very athletic offensive line. And it's a team that has really evolved offensively because I think, again, we, making some more parallels to Michigan, like this team is most comfortable. They, they would love to just run between the tackles and dominate mm -hmm. opponents, but that's not how they win these games. They do establish the run, but they have gotten creative with this offense and with what Stetson Bennett can do, Brock Bowers in particular. A lot of different trick plays and a little fun routes and wheel routes and all different sorts of things, but they will do some creative things in the passing game that, again, even last year's Georgia, two years ago Georgia, that they mm -hmm. didn't do. And so Todd Munkin is really opening up his bag here, and I think that that's going to also stress the Ohio State defense because they might see things that they haven't seen on film. 
I'm going to be fascinated to see kind of what they come out like defensively. I was surprised they didn't adjust more yeah. at halftime of the Michigan game, but now with a chance at what essentially is a do-over, as we talked about earlier, against a team with some really dynamic weapons, how do you approach this it? Is a, this is an opportunity uh, really for them to go out and execute a game plan that wasn't executed very well. Because I'll, I'll say this, there, there's no – when you get to this part – there's no offense or defense that, that was designed or, or to come up with that fails. It's about making sure it exe- yeah. it's yeah. being executed. Yes. And if it's not being executed to that level, adjustments need to be made. It worked on the grease board is what you're saying. It just didn't work on the field. Because it wasn't executed. Right, right, right. Uh, you got to make it work against yep. Georgia. 12 of their 13 wins by double-figure margins. <laughs> and we could, Listen, we've got to go to L.A. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. You personally? Yeah, we need. No, we, we all of us we need to be a, there. Yeah. This is a team deal. We, we, I mean, yeah, I want to go. Yeah, I, mean, I was like, I felt like this was a personal, like, <laughs> Howard wants to go to the beach situation. <laughs> Howard wants to be at the championship. Uh, game.